Some polynomial functions have imaginary zeros. So those zeros do not have a specific location that we can identify them from a graph. The only way we'll be able to find them is through some algebraic means. Now we can use the graph to help us get started in a similar fashion to what we saw in the last lesson. So the first thing we're going to do is, again, use a leading coefficient test to get a sense as to what the shape of the graph should look like. Then we're going to graph that function using Desmos, and then from that graph we're going to find integer zeros that we can then use via synthetic division to reduce the polynomial function from a higher order degree, like a third degree or a fourth degree, down to a quadratic. And then we can use our quadratic techniques to solve for those imaginary zeros. Because again, unlike the irrational zeros that we saw in the previous lesson, we don't even see a decimal value or anything like that. They don't appear on the graph, but we can see evidence that there must be some imaginary zeros, but the only way we're going to find them is via algebra. So for our first function, we've got this cubic function here. So using our leading coefficient test, we can see that our highest exponent is 3, so that means we're going to have a disco-shaped graph, and we have a negative leading coefficient. So that tells us that our graph is going to be down on the right and up on the left, with some sort of change in direction, most likely in the middle. To actually get the shape of the graph, we can go ahead and go to Desmos again, whether that's on an app on our calculator or on the computer, through the web, and we come up with a graph that looks like this. And so what we see here is something along the lines of the shape that we were expecting with that leading coefficient test prediction, but we only have one zero on our graph. It's here at 5, 0. There are no other real zeros. And so what that tells us is that we have a couple of imaginary zeros. Now there are other locations like the y-intercept here or this location as a local maximum that we need to be aware of, but they don't tell us anything about those remaining zeros. The only way we're going to figure those out is by using this real zero that we have here and then using our synthetic division and then quadratic techniques to solve for those two imaginary zeros. Now I am going to take note of the graph here. I've got the zero at five zero. This point right here looks like it's approximately, again for sketching purposes, it's a little bit more than three to the right and approximately 20 as the y-coordinate there. And then we've got our y-intercept that we can just get from the equation, whatever that uh, constant is at the end of our function, and then we take off from there. So if we go back and try to sketch our function, I'm going to go over five units for the one zero that we have. So I'm counting by ones in the horizontal direction. And the highest point that we had of note was at 20. So I'm going to go ahead and plot that uh, count by twos in the vertical direction. We could have counted by something bigger, but that'll do just fine for us. And so that uh, location that we had there was at uh, approximately 2 comma 20 was what we had had. Uh, we dipped down to about 5, so 2, 4, kind of halfway in between there. And then the last point we should probably take note of, uh, we kind of take off from there, so that uh, is probably good enough for us. So we've got a sketch that looks like this when we're all done with it. So again, this is the key point here that gets us going. So we know that the graph goes through 5 comma 0, so I'm going to use that in my synthetic division to reduce my uh, cubic function down to a quadratic. So I'm going to divide by 5 on the outside here. I use my coefficients from the inside. Negative 1, 5, negative 1, and 5. And if I do this correctly, I should end up with a remainder of 0. So in the vertical direction, we bring down the negative 1. 5 times negative 1 is negative 5. Add in the vertical direction, we get 0. 5 times 0 is 0. Negative 1 plus 0 is negative 1. And then 5 times negative 1 is negative 5, which indeed leads us to a remainder of 0. And so we've gone from an x cubed polynomial we've reduced it down to x squared. So now we're ready to write our quadratic that's been left behind, and then we can solve. So we're going to have negative 1x squared, or just negative x squared. There's no x term. And then minus 1, 
equals 0. So now I need to solve for x. So I'm going to move the x squared to the other side. I like to have that x squared term positive. So I'm going to add x squared to both sides. So we get negative 1 equals x squared. And so now I'm ready to take the square root of both sides. So that's what I'm going to do here. So we get x equals, now I need the plus or minus as always, and then I have this square root of negative 1, which going back to our study before, we know can be written as i, the imaginary unit. Square root of negative 1, we represent with an i. And so these are the other two zeros to go along with this one. So altogether, all of our zeros for this function are at x equals 5 is the only real one that we have, the only place where we cross through the x-axis. And then to go along with that, we've got two others, plus or minus i, because we always end up with as many zeros as we have the highest exponent. So we've got 3 as the highest exponent, the one real zero here, and then the two imaginary zeros, plus or minus i.